Sounds good. All right, everyone out there, uh, does everybody have their lunches and they're ready to go? If you if you do have your lunch, hold it up to the webcam. Just joking, I can't I can't see you. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but no, it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, to be back here. It's Wednesday already. It's Hump Day. Here we are, and it's so great to have you for another uh, installment of Lunch with a Curator. My name is Jeff Sellers. I'm the director of education and community engagement at the Tennessee State Museum. And uh, I'm really, really enjoying uh, these little maybe respites in the midst of uh, these challenging times just to get to uh, sit down, talk history, and uh, and meet with uh, some great curators, some, some wonderful um, professionals in the Tennessee history community here at the State Museum. So we're gonna have another fun day, uh, fun hour here for you uh, today as we discuss the style of the suffrage. <laughs> Many of you know that this year marks 100 years, 100 years ago this year, this summer, the 19th Amendment was ratified um, in the United States. And here in Tennessee, we were the final state to do that, making it a universal uh, constitutional amendment for all women throughout the country from that time till this time. So we're commemorating that with, uh, with a great ex exhibition that will open when re we reopen. Um, but in the meantime, we have some really great digital programming lined up for you. So um, I encourage you to check out our website, tnmuseum.org, uh, look at the calendar events page, and we will continually be adding new uh, digital programs coming up. Lots of exciting things we're getting lined up for that. Having said that, today's episode is, uh, our, is uh, with our curator of textiles and fashion, uh, Miss Amanda McCrary-Smith. And as I said, she'll be bringing a talk called Fashioning a Movement, the Style of the Suffragists. So uh, you know, what's up with those white dresses? What's up with the gold sashes? We're gonna learn all about that today. Before we do, let's go over those all important housekeeping tips. <laughs> very first thing is that mute button, right? Um, here with WebEx, that's what we're using. With WebEx, the mute button is a little microphone at the left uh, part of your screen, bottom left of your screen. Make sure that that mute button is red. It should all be red anyway, but just in case, make sure that uh, microphone is red and that means that uh, you are muted and uh, we can't hear dogs barking or doorbells ringing or anything like that. So uh, you should be good there. We do wanna hear from you. We want you to participate in this program today. So we ask that you use the chat feature and uh, the chat function is the little text bubble down at the bottom of your screen there. That little, um, a little kind of text bubble there. You click on that and you will have your uh, chat feature down at the bottom right. Type your question or comment, select all panelists, and that will send your question to us. At any time during the program, if you have a question, just type it in and we will um, we'll answer those questions at the end of our time. <laughs> Lastly, if you do have trouble today, we have um, our, our tech support online with us, Mamie Hassel and Rachel Helbring. And uh, just type a question to them, and they can help you with any kind of problems, audio uh, or computer that you might have. I think that's all of the um, all of the different housekeeping tips we have. I think it's now time to bring on our curator, uh, Miss Amanda McCreary Smith, is the curator of textiles and fashion at the State Museum. And uh, she is going to bring us that talk today on en entitled Fashioning a Movement, The Style of the Suffragists. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to Lunch with a Curator. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. It's all yours. Take it away. All right. Let me get my screen share here. Make sure I, there we go. We got it. I make it full screen. All right, um, welcome and thank you for joining me here in my kitchen for uh, our lunch and learn today. Um, I hope you're all well and I'm really grateful that you decided to, to be here with me. Um, 
Like Jeff said, my name is Amanda McCrary Smith, and I am the curator of textiles and fashion here at Tennessee State Museum. Um, I'm relatively new to the museum, um, and since I started, we've been in the process of planning the upcoming suffrage exhibit, like Jeff said, when we reopen, uh, that celebrates the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, my background as a historian is in material culture, historiography, and dress history. And suffrage wasn't something that I had a lot of experience with or, or really thought about significantly other than, you know, of course, I appreciate the sacrifice of the suffragists, but being able to work with some of these artifacts that I'm going to show you today has really given me a lot of perspective about the suffrage movement and how even though 100 years might seem kind of long to us, it actually, in historical time, it's not far from, you know, where we're sitting today. My great-grandmother was 13 when the 19th Amendment passed, and then my great-great-grandmother, Loney, she was the exact same age as me, 43, when the 19th Amendment passed, and they lived about a mile from the Capitol building in Nashville, and so to think that they lived through that important moment and what it must have meant to them has made it much more poignant for me to study some of these artifacts. Um, and then I also, because of my background in dress and textile history, I think a lot about how grateful I am that I can wear what I like and I can wear um, you know, anything that I, I want to and no one puts any sort of parameters on what's acceptable for my clothing. And that is something that women in the past definitely did not have the opportunity or the, um, the privilege of, of sharing with me. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that they set a precedence and changed the rigid rules of dress. So that I can sit here in my, you can't see it, but I have on my leggings. Um, I dress fancy on the top so that you, you know, so I look nice. Um, and then another thing is that we're also used to the concept of branding, whether it be literally or not. You know, our clothing has words and logos and inferences on them, um, and that was not true in the past. So, you know, in the past, identifying yourself with a particular movement could be subversive or it could even be dangerous. And, you know, you were visually identifying yourself as part of something that people thought of as being scandalous or thought of as being politically controversial, like votes for women. And, you know, some of the very first movements in, in, in history, some of the first, like, protest movements, people identified themselves very visibly as part of those movements. And so I think dress as a form of rebellion is a really interesting topic, and that's what we're going to explore today. Um, and first, I think everybody knows what suffrage means, I hope. Um, it means the right to vote. Um, but why in Tennessee and at the Tennessee State Museum would it be so important to us to talk about the fashion of the suffragettes or to have a giant exhibit coming up about suffrage and, and the movement that women fought for to get the right to vote? Um, many of you probably know this because I think a lot of you are either my colleagues or you're Tennesseans, um, but Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, so the amendment had passed through Congress and it was sent to the states to be ratified and they needed the 36th vote in order for it to be written into law. And it came down to Tennessee because it had stalled at 35 states. And so on August 18, 1920, um, the entire nation was looking at Tennessee uh, to see what was going to happen with the 19th Amendment. And uh, the famous story, of course, is that the 11th hour, um, and I don't want to give away too much because you need to come see the exhibit. Um, but Tennessee made the decision to give women the right to vote. And it was a really fitting end to a hard fought battle um, in Tennessee. There were all kinds of different women from different backgrounds and races and social and economic differences and regions across the state that came together to get the vote for women. Um, so we're celebrating that 100 year anniversary, but that's why fashion and style of the suffragettes is a really important moment and applicable to Tennessee history, even though we're going to look at a lot of history that is not necessarily Tennessee history today. Um, so I want to start by talking about what some of the, the terminology means, because I think a lot of people don't think about what does dress mean, what does style mean, and I use those terms a lot because I am a dress historian. Um, dress is a term that we use to mean what you're wearing 
And sometimes it's defined as costume, but a lot of dress historians don't like that terminology because unless you're familiar with the formal term, costume kind of implies something that's false, or we think of Halloween, or we think of being, you know, um, in something that's kind of comical. So I prefer to say dress. Um, and like I said, dress just means what you have on, what, what, the, what clothes we put on our bodies. That's our dress. Um, and then style, of course, is something that's a lot more difficult to define. Style is what we are showing outwardly as an expression of ourselves. So it's what you like to wear, what you like to show people that, you know, your individual style is. It can be anything from identifying yourself with a certain group, a certain type of music that you like. Um, like I said earlier, in the 21st century, we can wear words on our clothing that say, you know, what we support. Um, but it's a visible way of identifying yourself. Um, and identifying yourself, you know, as your as an individual. So dress and style kind of go hand in hand, and they they're, they're related to the way that we like to look. Um, but people in the past did not necessarily have those sorts of advantages. Um, it was difficult to express yourself through your personal style because there were very rigid rules placed on people in the past as to what they could wear, what styles they could wear. Um, especially for women and people of what were considered lower social classes. And this is true throughout the world. Um, it was true, you know, in, especially in the European world. Um, we're going to talk about that in, in, in just a second, but it had made its way over into the colonial world too from Europe. And so you had these ideas of what people, how people were supposed to look, what was morally and virtuously the way that you were supposed to dress. Um, and a lot of the reasoning behind that was that Atlantic trade brought new materials and um, goods to the market like silks that people thought of as luxury goods. And those luxury goods were regulated by antiquated laws that were called sumptuary laws. And the sumptuary laws are technically what they meant was they were they were supposed to regulate consumption. And so sumptuary is a shortened term for, for consumption laws. But what they really did was make rules about what people could wear, so dress regulations, if they were not elite or wealthy. It kept those fine silks, those, you know, the silks that were, were uh, woven into velvet or woven into to satins, it kept those out of the hands of people that were considered lower class. Um, the same thing with, you know, with Atlantic trade and the America, you have the fur trade, you have cotton enter into the market um, and, and wealthy people wanted to keep those things for themselves. So they established these sumptuary laws that said that if you were of a certain class, you could not wear the same things that elite people did. Um, and then not declared by law, but in, in, you know, entering into the 19th and 20th century, you see these kind of, um, these de jure laws where people were, where it was implied that you could not wear a certain thing or women were supposed to dress a certain way. Um, we see a radical change. Um, and if you look at this slide, focus your attention here on the, the gentleman on the right. Um, when the French Revolution began in 1789, and that was one of the places where these sumptuary laws were the most rigid, um, new ideas about who could wear what emerged as a form of protest. So during the, the French Revolution, people who, who were considered peasants by the monarchy, um, when, they, when they rose up to fight for democracy, they chose to deliberately wear the styles that the rich and the wealthy would wear. So you would see in the material, they didn't have access to the same materials, but they would wear the different styles. So they would have the knee breeches or they would dress in these kind of elaborate costumes to mimic the wealthy. And then they also chose to, to kind of rebel against it by wearing clothing that differentiated themselves from the monarchy and very visibly identified themselves as being for the revolution. Um, the gentleman on the right in this illustration is a member of what they call the sans culottes, which um, it, it literally means without knee breeches. And knee breeches were the way that the wealthy dressed. And so people seeking to differentiate themselves from the wealthy or come a part of this revolutionary movement 
would wear clothing that identified themselves as revolutionaries. And the sans culottes movement was one of the biggest ones. Um, and then also look at his red cap here um, in the photo, the Phrygian cap. And I, I think the Phrygian cap is one of the more interesting um, dress history items. Um, the Phrygian cap is not without controversy when it comes to its origins. Um, but it was a red brimless cap, also known as a liberty cap, because you'll see it in imagery of the American Revolution as well. But the red Phrygian cap was worn by French revolutionaries in order to show that they were with the revolution. Um, it was actually so, so symbolic of the revolution that contrary to, you would think the sumptuary laws and with the ways that people were forced to um, you know, dress a certain way before the revolution, the revolutionaries also tried to force people who were supporters of the revolution to wear the Phrygian cap. Um, that's a little contradictory, but still, it's a very potent symbol of revolution. And then you can also see what he's wearing here in this illustration, the colors that will really become the French, the official French flag after democracy is over, or after democracy becomes the way that France is ruled and the monarchy is overthrown. Um, <clears throat> it was actually so important to the French revolutionaries to, to get rid of things like sumptuary laws or class distinctions defined by dress, that one of the first things that they wrote into the French constitution was the, the this freedom of dress clause. So kind of like American revolutionaries wanted, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, things the British had denied them, the French revolutionaries wanted freedom of dress because that's what the monarchy had denied them. Um, and, you know, you probably, think, um, here's another Phrygian cap too on this, um, this symbol of the French Revolution. So what does the French Revolution have to do with the fridge um, and clothing? Well, the idea that clothing was appropriate or who, the idea of who clothing was appropriate for, what styles people should wear, um, existed as implication in, in Britain and in America. So not some sumptuary laws, but this sort of implied law as we move into the 19th and 20th century as the suffrage movement begins. Um, and then it also is kind of existing with this same, this same revolutionary spirit of the French Revolution. So you have these two ideas that are very uh, different than one another, very disparate of, you know, we should be allowed to wear whatever we want. And then these kind of implied laws or implied rules that say, well, that's not socially acceptable for you to wear. So it's a big confrontation. And then as movements like the suffrage movement emerge, you see fashion become a form of protest. Um, the movement to gain the vote for women started first in, in Britain. So you have the British suffragettes who originate this idea. And then the American suffragette movement exists alongside of the British movement and they influence each other. But it's really the British suffragists that start this idea of fashion as a form of protest in the suffragist movement. Um, you'll see here on the left side of the screen, um, a little panel that says, when was this dress in fashion? And I wanted to show this imagery because the suffragist movement emerged along um, with the backdrop of the Victorian period. And the Victorian period, if any of you guys know anything about it, um, it was a very long period of time, 1837 to 1901, and then we enter into the Edwardian period. But the Victorian period was a strange time uh, for dress and for ideas about womanhood and um, domesticity. Uh, there, was, there was a real focus on your dress in the Victorian period in both England and America as being representative of your womanhood, um, being representative of your virtuosity, of your, your morality even. Um, you can see here in the slide, starting in the middle, um, and we don't, we don't usually think about this, but like think in America, like the antebellum period where you see the big hoot skirts, that's still Victorian dress. That still takes place in the Victorian period. So all of those layers, all of those underskirts, tight corseted bodices, things that are not particularly comfortable. Um, it was what women were used to wearing, so it's hard to make that judgment to say if it was comfortable or not, but I know I personally find it very restrictive. Um, and again, that is just what they had to wear. 
but we're not talking about clothing that is very functional. It's not clothing where you can really, you know, say we're talking about the suffragists that you can march in, that you can even in some cases sit down very comfortably in. Um, but it was considered what was appropriate for women to wear. And there, there were also ideas you can see in that illustration of it was not considered proper for women to go out without a hat, without their hair covered. Um, and all these ideas are in place as we talk about women marching for suffrage. So think about the contradiction there. Um, and British women decided to adapt their style to look a certain way that identified them as suffragettes. And one of the ways that they did that was through colors. So instead of like this radical change of, you know, shortening their dresses or something like that, they started with the idea of color um, and color would identify them as suffragettes. Um, we have here uh, on this slide, what do the colors mean? Well, the color, the British suffragettes were first to adopt the, the what we think of as the tricolors. So white for purity, purple for loyalty and dignity and green for hope. Um, these were adapted first by the Women's Social and Political Union in England or the WSPU. Um, by a lady whose name was Emmeline Pethick Lawrence. And she described her choice of purple as the royal color. It stands for the royal blood that flows in the veins of every suffragette, the instinct of freedom and dignity. White stands for purity in private and public life, and green is the color of hope and the emblem of spring. Um, that is from their, their publication called Votes for Women. So their, their newspaper that they put out told women how they should dress and what colors they should dress in to identify themselves as suffragettes. Um, the American suffragettes also adopted the same colors, except they got rid of the green and adopted the gold or the yellow instead. Um, the yellow or the gold, um, as you can see here, the suffragists volume one, number four says, gold is the color of light and life. It is as the torch that guides our purpose, pure and uns unswerving. So the gold represented the purpose. And I wanted you to see in color, um, what a suffragist or what a, a American suffragist would look like. Um, the, our, um, one of our museum education specialists, Jennifer Watts is here on the right and she is wearing her living history outfit as Tennessee suffrage, suffragist leader and Dallas Dudley. And I asked Jennifer for permission to use her, her image because I think that it's really striking to imagine, since we're so used to seeing just black and white photos of these women, it's very striking to imagine a marching army of women wearing white and gold sashes that say votes for women down the street in the thousands. Um, and she also, if you guys are, are interested in uh, more about Tennessee suffrage and Ann Dallas Sudley, Jennifer wrote a wonderful blog um, on our museum website where she talks about portraying Ann Dallas Dudley. Um, and I'm sure that you will see much more of her um, and our other museum specialists when we get closer to the exhibit. Um, we'll do some living history with that as well. Um, I also wanted to make sure that I touched on the anti-suffragists because one of the critiques leveled at women was that, leveled at women who were who wanted the vote was that they were masculine or that they were trying to you know, go against these Victorian ideals of womanhood. Um, and that actually one of the reasons for the white and the fine, the fine clothing was to show their femininity. Um, this propaganda poster, I think is very interesting. Um, it shows a very finely dressed lady being escorted by a lady police officer and a female firefighter. Um, you know, the never homes that would have gone against that concept of, of domesticity to, you know, they were out doing things and they should be at home with the children or should be taking care of the home. And that was definitely an affront to Victorian ideals. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that even in this propaganda, that would have been considered a proper style for women to wear during the time period. So the propaganda didn't try to get too racy with the clothing, even though it's supposed to be making fun of the suffragists. Um, and then, one of the other things that I wanted to show you besides dress is the symbolism of, um, of the suffragists, because sometimes when we look at the banners, which we'll see in the museum as we get closer to the exhibit, or when we get the exhibit open, 
um, you'll see certain symbolism repeated throughout the states or throughout mm, different, you know, women's suffrage groups. And I wanted to explain one of them to you because you do see it so often, and that's the bluebird. Um, I also wanted to show off our equal suffrage campaign committee banner, uh, which will be in the in the exhibit soon. Um, one of the first states to vote on a referendum was Massachusetts in 1915. And in order to galvanize the movement, women put out these 10 bluebirds. Um, and over here on the left, you see one of those 10 bluebirds. Um, they're about 12 inches by four inches across. And so they were like little advertising posters, um, but they were made of 10. And you'd see the votes for women down the chest of the bluebird, November 2nd, 15 was when they held the referendum in Massachusetts. Um, that referendum failed, but it was the first time that you really see this mass organized movement to get out um, advertising or signage for the vote. And there was another there was another referendum shortly after that in New York that also failed. Um, but even though it was unsuccessful, suffragists started using the the symbolism of the bluebird to kind of honor these first women to try to get a referendum for the vote. Um, and you can see in this slide, you know, they had suffrage bluebird day on July 19th, where 100,000 of these bluebirds were pinned up around the state. Um, on our banner here for the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Campaign Committee, you can see the small bluebirds who were used in homage to those early women um, in the Massachusetts referendum. And then you can also see that the banner uses the gold of suffrage so that beautiful gold silk um, with you know gold metallic paint um, and that it's the way that it's decorated is with with paint um, it's painted silk and I don't think that you can get a, a very good idea from a thumbnail picture of this how truly remarkable this artifact is but it, it really is striking to imagine the women in their white and their gold sashes holding this banner up in front of them as they marched down the street for suffrage um, not all, like I said before, not all suffrage, not all suffragists wore the the white and the gold or the tricolors. Some suffragists wore um, a different style, and that has to do with the fact that as we get to the end of the Victorian period and we move into the 19 teens and the Edwardian period, um, things are really changing for women. Even though they don't have the vote yet, they are going to work in a variety of vocations from factory work to medical work to clerical work um, and those styles that i showed you before with all the different layers um, those are really not conducive to any kind of real you know physical work um, you also see women moving into uh, spaces and activities that are that previously were exclusively for men and one of those that we really take for granted and don't think about it all is, is physical exercise um, or leisure activities. And the big one was bicycling. Um, in the early part of the 20th, bicycling was all the rage. Um, I personally have never tried to ride a bicycle on with a skirt and underskirts on, but I imagine that it's very difficult. Um, and so you see the advent of more functional clothing you see shortened um, hemlines. You can actually see this in this artifact. Um, this is not from our museum. This is from the Daughters of the American Revolution Museum. It dates to approximately 1908. Um, it's a brown tweed. And it also has, and I thought some of you, if you were around the same age as me, might think this is interesting. Um, it has a cotton dickey. Um, dickies were not just a weird invention of the 1980s to wear with your ugly bugle boy sweater. Um, they were actually around much longer ago than the 1980s, and they were meant to give the impression that you had a shirt on under your jacket, but so, so as to remain proper, but it would keep you cool under that heavy tweed material, and it was also good for the beginnings of these leisure activities. So um, that's not a real shirt under there. It's just a little false neckline. Um, also, uh, another interesting thing about this particular outfit, and it's hard for us in a modern time to to realize this, is um, that shortened style, even though it looks very long to women of our day, 
Um, it allowed women the freedom to work, it allowed women the freedom to do leisure activities. And so just that one or two inches of, of lifting of the hem was considered radical in terms of dress history. So you see that in the 1910s, um, dress lines start to change. And then after, um, so after the 19th Amendment passed in August of 1920, women's styles changed radically. Um, and even though they were kind of controversial still, among certain facets of society, um, the new rights and roles and the opportunities that women had in society, um, it gave them this feeling, this empowerment to, to change the way that they dress and to also feel like, you know, it wasn't an indicator of your morality or an indicator of your, your you know, how virtuous, virtuous you were by what you wore. Um, and that's, you know, that's a very modern idea and it's something that sometimes we still struggle with today. Um, clothing is still rather controversial sometimes. Um, but on the right of this photo, you see, I wanted to, to show her off too. This is Catherine Talty Penny. Um, it's a portrait that's part of our museum collection and she was a very important figure in the Tennessee suffragist movement. Um, she was a political activist from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, her husband was the president of the National Coca-Cola Bottling Company, so she was a woman who was of some means. Um, she became active in the Nashville Equal Suffrage League and local Democratic Party. Um, in 1915, she co-chaired with Abby Crawford Milton the campaign committee of the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association. Um, the, the banner that you saw in the in the slide previously. And she was so good at organizing that by the time the 19th Amendment passed, by the time it was ratified, I mean, not passed, um, but by the time it was ratified in Tennessee, every county in Tennessee had a suffrage club thanks to her organization. Um, she was known for her intellect. She was known for her, you know, her being bold in politics. Um, she eventually went on to be the second president of the Tennessee League of Women Voters, and she held several positions in the state Democratic Party. Um, I, put, I put her photo in here because what she is wearing in, in this picture on the right is very, this is a very typical dress that women would have worn in the late 1920s and early 30s. Um, you can see that, you know, her, it's sleeveless, it's gauzy, it's beaded, it's short. Um, you know, it's something that even 25 years before would have been absolutely unthinkable for women to be wearing. Um, and also on the left here, of course, you have some flappers, um, some ladies in the 1920s who are dancing and wearing the shorter popular styles um, that characterize the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age. Um, and they also note, note that they have on, you know, they have on shorter styles, shorter hair uh, was also something that became popular, again, unthinkable. Um, and, and hats, again, were no longer considered very, it wasn't considered, you know, improper, although they do have on hats. The, the cloquet style, which they have on, was the style of the day. Um, it means belle in, Fr in French, and it was considered one of the, the things that every young lady had to have as an accessory. Um, and then eventually, because of these styles, because we see these changes in dress and these new radical ideas about women can wear, eventually, um, in the same time period, post, uh, post 19th Amendment, women get the opportunity to wear pants. Um, I personally can't imagine my life without pants. Uh, the, first, the first women's trousers uh, were invented in 1911 by the famous French designer Paul Perrault. Um, it was an idea that didn't really make its way into America for quite a while. Um, but in the 1930s, you see, you know, actresses like Marlene Dietrich start to wear men's styles, men's suits. And then after that, women can pretty much wear um, all of the different garments that used to be associated with men. Although, again, still not without some controversy. And then, um, you know, to put it into perspective, about why this is really important to understand when we look at the boldness of the women in the suffrage movement or prior to them, you know, this radical expression of protest by the French revolutionaries is that it's still a part of our world today. Um, you know, dress is a signifier that we stand for a movement or part of a group. Um, it, can, it can be a really powerful thing. 
Um, it can be a powerful unifier. It can also show individualism. I mean, maybe you're not part of the group, but it's still something that in our day and age, we have the freedom to express. And in this slide, I, I wanted to show you a couple of, couple of examples, uh, notable examples of how the past makes its way into the present in terms of protest and rebellion. Because dress and branding oneself is really, you know, it's, it's still alive and well. Um, in the photo at the top right, the French protesters marching in the 2018 Yellow Vest Movement. Um, and the Yellow Vest Movement, in case you're not familiar, was a movement uh, against rising fuel prices in France. And it was started by truck drivers. And the truck drivers often have to wear these yellow vests. They have to keep them in their truck by law. And if they're doing deliveries or they have to stop and do maintenance, they put them on. So like we would think of as, you know, road work vests. And in support of those, those protesting truck drivers, the average person in France started wearing these yellow vests to show their support for the movement. And I chose this particular photo because in the yellow vest movement, you also see the return of the Phrygian cap. So what these people are marching in is look at the Phrygian cap of the French Revolution. So they're linking their past to their present and paying homage to the legacy of the French revolutionaries. And it's 229 years later. So that's the, the, that that symbol is so powerful that it never really made its way out of, you know, the, the symbolism of what French people consider their legacy. Um, and then the same thing on the bottom right, you can see female members of Congress um, at the State of the Union address wearing all white. Um, and the all white was in support of female politicians and also, you know, their ability to take part now in our national democracy as lawmakers. And then also honoring the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. So you have two things happening here, honoring their foremothers who came before them to give them the opportunity to be there, and then also this kind of unified look that shows support for movement and shows support for women in politics. Um, and I think, I think that's about it. Um, I think it wraps it up. And again, like Jeff said, I'm happy to take questions, anything you might want to know. Um, any questions you might have about Raji and Kat or Vicki, um, I'll be happy to answer them. All right. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much, Amanda. That was fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, it's such a great uh, thing to think about. I mean, you take you know, talk about the French Revolution and, and, uh, and how it impacts uh, fashion throughout, even into the suffrage movement. That was a that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we've got some good questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, and for our audience out there, um, you know, type them in as we go. I'll try to get I'll try to get to all of them as they come in. Uh, lots of people complimenting you, Amanda, on a great presentation. Thank you. Um, all right, so here's one about hats. Uh, let's see. Uh, why were hats so important during this time period? And later, uh, since men also often wore hats, uh, did it serve a purpose in the movement? No, hats actually at this point in time, like with the suffragettes, um, after about 1895 and entering into the early 1900s, it really just became a fashion. Um, it was okay to go out of your house without your hat on. Um, but a hat for a very long time, especially for women, um, it signified a sort of um, formal dress that was appropriate for you to go out in public in. Um, it wasn't a matter of like not showing your hair or covering your face or anything like that. It was just considered proper etiquette. And the Victorians were obsessed with etiquette. Um, you know, even down to how you styled your hair and, you know, what kind of lace you wore was important to Victorians. So it was really just, you know, playing along with the Victorian ideals of etiquette. Uh, all right, cool. Um, you've got a great picture there. I'm glad you kind of have that picture of the uh, march there. Um, one question asks, was it a requirement to wear uh, the white dress and gold sash in those, in those um, marches there um, or could anyone, you know, wear whatever they wanted to wear? I, I'm not sure if you know that answer, but. <laughs> well, it, it depends. Um, I know in the, it was, so the, the British suffragette movement was much more radical and militant. And if you read some of the literature, 
that was put out by the British suffragists. Um, it is more than just an implication that you need to wear the white. Um, it is definitely the tricolor. They even went as far as have tricolor shoes and tricolor underwear sometimes, not that anyone could see them, but um, in the United States, it was more of a way to galvanize the movement, but it wasn't a requirement at all. Um, people wore regular clothing. You know, you have, if you could see, if we had photographs that were like a long shot of the marching line, you would see that there are people in all different colors of clothing or all different styles of clothing. It just, the white and the gold sash stands out. And there were also different chapters of people who, you know, different suffrage groups. Um, and certain groups were more partial to the white and gold sashes. It tended to be the more wealthy or elite groups of women because they could afford to buy those. And then other groups of women, again, just wore the regular clothes. Um, sometimes you see people in all black even. Cool. Here's one. Uh, someone writes, I've seen antique jewelry advertised as suffragette ring or suffragette pin. Was jewelry a part of the movement? Jewelry was a part of the movement, especially breeches. Um, if women would wear jewelry that signified that they were a part of the suffrage movement, um, they look like little medals or they'd be the gold, um, you know, the, the, the gold color like the sash would be. And it was a much more subtle way of showing that you were a part of the movement. Um, there would also be, uh, you know, pins for your, pins for your collar. Um, sometimes pins for your lapel, and they would be little tiny indicators that you were a part of the movement. Um, we actually have some of those in our collection, and they're going to be a part of the suffrage exhibit when we get it put up at the museum. Awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, that um, you know fashion can change by by class. Certainly, um, you know it's a uh, uh, it's it's one thing to be able to afford um, some of the dresses or or clothes, that, or, and others may not be able to. We also here's one. We also know that African American women played uh, a very important role in uh, the movement. Was there any differences, or was it a unified thing to to wear those same um, fashions, uh, even uh, in the African American community? Were there any differences there? You know. Um... The African American women who were suffragists were a really vibrant part of the movement. But one of the criticisms that's often leveled at the suffragist movement in general is that, you know, it was a lot of these women wearing their all white, the wealthy elite women, excluded African American women from their groups. Um, and that's not always true. I mean, you do see some chapters that allowed African American women to march with them. But for the most part, um, the exclusion also came down to those identifiers. So you do not see African-American women wearing all white outfits, marching with the white suffragettes. Um, there's a famous story about um, Ida B. Wells from Memphis, Tennessee, who was marching in a suffragist march in Memphis and was excluded to the back of the line. And this is a woman who is one of the most powerful voices for civil rights you know, in the in, the United States being excluded, and she stepped out of the back of that line in a way of saying, I'm here, I'm a leader too. And so, you know, yes, you do have divisions, um, but you had certain people who, who kind of came to the fore and became very important leaders within the movement for African American women. Okay. Uh, we'll take a couple more. Uh, we have about that. And uh, thank you to everyone for getting these questions in there. They're a lot of fun. Sorry, we can uh, maybe we can have the, some more of these questions uh, through our social media channels. So uh, stay tuned for uh, for more stuff for that. So that'll be that'll be fun. Um, did Carrie Chapman Cat wear this white outfit when she showed up to the state legislature for the ratification vote in the summer of 1920? What was she? What was her um, uh, style of fashion? Well, you know, I have to say, I don't know what her individual style of fashion was. Um, I am more focused on the different groups in Tennessee and what they wore. And then I actually know a lot more about the British suffragettes than I do the American suffragettes because they originated it. Um, I would have to get back to you on that question after looking up some photos of Carrie and what she wore. Um, but I am guessing, I just, I would, I would venture to say that she was not into the frilly white, and she probably wore things that were a little bit more um, 
demure. Yeah, she was uh, she was uh, older by this time, and uh, you know probably um, still still kind of um, wore that more of that Victorian st style um, rather than the more edgier edgier. Maybe some of those younger suffragists uh, uh, ventured out and, and wore. All right, well, uh, let's see if I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's an interesting point too. Is that some of those old Victorian styles still persisted in the 1910s because generationally not everybody adopted the new styles. I mean, just like we don't now, like, you know, I'm 43. I don't wear what 20 year old people are wearing uh, because I don't want to. Um, and also, you know, it's not really something that I would consider wearing. And it was kind of like that then, even though to us, they may just look like long dresses, it was considered a younger style. Okay, last question. This is the one to kind of go out, a good good one to go out on. Um, okay. This summer's commemoration of the passage of, uh, or the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of sad that, that, you know, we were so, we were uh, uh, so looking forward to many of these things already have, have, have begun to happen. Many of these will now be taking place virtually in terms of the commemoration. Um, what are some of the dresses uh, or style that you would recommend we um, uh, we we sort of wear uh, for some of these commemorative events, whether they be virtual or um, in in person? You know, I think that um, I think that you could wear modern versions of the all white. Um, you could definitely wear modern versions of the gold. Um, you can incorporate gold into your outfit. I know personally, um, I shy away from yellow. I think it is the worst color possible for me. Um, so I would probably be more one to wear the symbolism of the suffragettes, um, you know, the, the, the gold brooch or what have you. I did wear my suffragette hair today, um, my Victorian hairstyle. So you could do that as well with your hair. Um, but like I said in the beginning, you know, clothing now, is branded in a way that we can express ourselves very visibly. We could all wear votes for women shirts uh, to celebrate, you know, the foremothers who came before us to give us the vote. So I think there's all kinds of creative ways you could definitely incorporate that in your outfit. You could wear some bloomers, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think of think of take uh, take a modern twist on an old style is always a good and fun thing to uh, to do. Yeah. Make it your own individual kind of. Uh, yeah. Style. All right. Well, Amanda, that's where we will leave it today. Uh, but my goodness, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining me in my kitchen. <laughs> um, all right. For everyone else, thank you so much uh, for for attending another one of our digital programs. Um, be sure to come back next week. Uh, next week we have we'll uh, meet our curator of social history specializing in African-American history. Ms. Bridget Jones will be joining us for, uh, I'm sure, a fascinating talk again next, next week, this time next week. So um, I had a few questions about when the exhibit will open. Uh, it's all dependent upon when we reopen. Uh, we're hoping to, to get those uh, as we all kind of begin to reopen and, and, and make plans for that. We're all um, definitely going to hopefully get that uh, open soon thereafter when we get to reopen. So stay tuned. Best place to, to, to get in touch with us or connect with us is our website, tnmuseum.org, or any number of our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get all of that information. So uh, and on behalf of the staff of the Tennessee State Museum, thank you so much for connecting with us. Um, until next week, We'll see you on social media and then uh, we'll see you right back here next Wednesday for lunch with the curator. That's where we'll leave it, folks. Thanks so much and take care. Bye bye. bye.